Welcome to Parapsychology Research and Education. This year we're having a topic for the Paramook, Survival of Death and Parapsychology. The live session started on April 6th and will continue through April uh, through May 19th, which is just next weekend. The enrollment will end on May 31st. So if you have friends or colleagues that are interested in joining us, as long as you're enrolled by May by the end of the day on May 31st. Um, you'll have access to all of the materials and uh, recordings and everything in the course room until April of 2020 at least. So before we get started, I would like to uh, give a shout out to Radiant Skies, the artist from 123rf.com, from whom we license this parapsychology wordle as our logo for the course. I'd also like to thank Lisa Coley, the president of the Parapsychology Foundation for their support of Carlos and I as we work on the course. And of course, that's me there. And I'd like to thank Brian Williams from the Psychical Research Foundation, who is our intrepid co-moderator for discussion forums. And as you can tell, we're getting a little bit close to the end here. Here's Dr. Alexander Morera Almeida, who you see on the screen. So let me tell you a little bit about him. Um, he's an associate professor of psychiatry, the founder and director of the Research Center in Spirituality and Health at the School of Medicine at the Universidade Federal de Juiz de Fora. I hope that was close, in Brazil. He's the chair of the WPA, World Psychiatric Association, its section on religion, spirituality, and psychiatry, and the coordinator of the section on spirituality of the Brazilian Psychiatric Association. He obtained a medical degree at UFJF and was trained in psychiatry and cognitive behavioral therapy at the Institute of Psychiatry of the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, where he also obtained his PhD in health sciences. Formerly a postdoctoral fellow in religion and health at Duke University, his main research interests involve mind-brain relationship, empirical studies of spiritual experiences, the impact of spirituality on health, as well as the methodology and epistemology of this research field. He has also authored more than 150 scientific papers and book chapters. He coordinates TV Nupes, a YouTube channel for science education on the interface between science, health, and spirituality that has reached more than 190 countries. So we highly recommend this particular YouTube channel. A number of the uh, offerings are in English as well as in Portuguese. So the talk today is Mind, Body, Independence, and Survival of Death. The talk will be divided into four parts, philosophical and theoretical aspects regarding the mind-brain problem, emphasizing common theoretical misconceptions and misinterpretations of neuroscience findings, the importance of spiritual psychic experience or psychic experiences to advance our under understanding of the mind-brain problem, what constitutes evidence for conscious survival, consciousness surviving after death, and methodological and theoretical guidelines to advance research on the possibility of consciousness survival. So here is your PowerPoint, um, Alexander, and I'm going to get out of your way, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you for having me here. It's a great pleasure uh, to discuss with... Uh, such uh, exciting audience from different parts of the world about uh, a topic uh, that's so important. And uh, uh, and also, Carlos, I look very serious. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so, uh, as, so it's a great pleasure, and I look forward also for the questions and comments uh in the end so i think we have plenty of time also for discussions and for exchange ideas okay so I, I will talk about some topics on consciousness especially some philosophical and neuroscientific discussion on consciousness the origin of mind origin of consciousness and also the some aspects of the research on the survival of consciousness okay let's go so uh, one point uh, regarding discussing survival issues, we know that most spiritual and religious traditions around the globe uh, assume some form of survival. Actually, the idea that human beings are, are something beyond just the body 
and there is something that persists beyond the death <clears throat> is usually a core belief of most spiritual and religious traditions. And uh, despite uh, the idea, secularization thesis that proposed that most of the world population would become uh, secular or specifically non-religious or materialist during the 20th century, uh, we know that it has not happened. The, here we have some of the best world data on religious affiliation. It, it is from the Pew Research Center. The Pew Research Center one is one of the best uh, sources for surveys on spirituality and religion around the globe. So just to give you an idea, uh, it is a survey from 2010. And we have here that 84% of the world population has some religious affiliation. About 16% are unaffiliated. They don't have a specific religion, but it does not mean that they are not spiritual people. We know that there are a lot of people that are spiritual, but not religious. So as we can see by large, the majority of the world population hold some uh, religious belief and also some spiritual belief. And according to some projections in this, uh, uh, on this distribution, uh, it's predicted that uh, in the next 50 years, two groups will decrease the share in the world population, the unaffiliated and the Buddhists. The, these two groups probably will decrease in the share of the population and Muslims will increase and become close to Christians around the globe. Okay. And this is exactly what, what I said. I, I apologize because it's a bit small here, but that is exactly in 2006, in 2016, uh, we have, no, 2060, uh, we have Christians on the same level, about 30%, Muslim, increasing Muslims, decrease of unaffiliated and of Buddhists. So as we can see, the, the perspective in the next decades is to increase the religious affiliation of the world population. So in some sense, also the, inter, the interest on survival issues and things like that. And because of that, because of the importance of spirituality in the world population, it's now well recognized based on literally thousands of studies that spiritual and religious involvement, beliefs and behaviors are strongly relate to mental health, to health as a whole, even to mortality, to lower mortality, but also is related to mental health. For example, higher levels of religious affiliation and beliefs and practices is related to lower depressive symptoms, lower suicide rates, abuse uh, of substance, and uh, a better quality of life on average. And because of that, for example, the World Psychiatric Association published recently a position statement uh, emphasizing the importance of psychiatrists around the globe taking in consideration the spirituality of patients. So it's just to provide a background about the relevance nowadays in the world and also in the academic community about the topic of spirituality. As, and as I said previously, uh, the belief of survival after death is actually, I believe, uh, that's very widespread in, in the world as a whole, and also is usually in the core of most religious or spiritual traditions. This is a very interesting data from the World Value Survey showing that the belief in life after death is held by the majority of the population in the most populous countries around the globe. Okay, so as we can see here, a, a, a high level, and specifically regarding Russia, is interesting. Even after 70 years of active and violent suppression of any spiritual belief, and also a violent suppression of religions, beliefs, religious practices, and also they had classes on scientific atheism in college, in schools, universities. Despite of that, uh, there is still a, a reasonable share of uh, uh, believing life after death, 
here the 37 percent but it has increased in the last next in the last years and what is interesting uh the increase in belief in life after death was higher among the people with higher education with people with at least college education in russia so as we can see uh differently from what sometimes is said uh, the belief in life after death is still widespread in the world and it's not necessarily related to uh, lower educational uh, development. Just to provide some examples, some studies performed in the US and in Poland, they found no association between the belief in life after death and educational level. We performed a study in Brazil, 600 uh, uh, inpatients in a general hospital and also their companions in, in, in the hospital. Uh, and we found on the opposite, we, had, we, we found a, a direct relationship between ed educational level and uh, acceptance of life after death. The sense that the higher the educational level the higher they believe in life after death. So, uh, so it's, it's just one data show, another data showing that usually is not correct to, uh, to state that usually uh, the higher level of education is relates to lower level in survival after death. And um, and as Ian Stevenson, one of the perhaps the most important researcher from the past century in survival issue is stated uh, some decades ago, the question of whether man survives after death is certainly one of the most important that he can ask about himself. Despite formidable difficulties, the question is amenable to empirical investigation. That is the point. Uh, uh, how can we translate a uh, metaphysical or religious or spiritual issue in a meta in a empirically in empirical question that could be amenable to scientific investigation and it, it's important also because the the it relates closely to the mind brain problem the mind brain problem is exactly what is the mind and how does the mind correlate to the brain is mind a brain product? Is mind something beyond the brain? Does mind survive to the brain? And this is a millionaire philosophical and scientific challenge, at least since ancient Greece, we have discussions and debates on this topic. And one of the major uh, barriers to the concept of survival in modern academic environment is uh, psycho physical chemical reductionism so the the, the the point here is that one of the major blocks to the discussion in the academic environment on the topic of survival after death is the idea of the physicalism or the physical chemical reductionism that's the idea that everything that exists in the universe can and must be reduced to physical particles or force. So this is called materialism, physicalism, or materialist reductionism. Uh, this is, uh, it's actually, it's not a result from scientific developments. This is a metaphysical assumption. Some people assume that everything in the universe must be explained only by particles and physical force. However, this, as I said previously, it, this is not an essential component of science. This is a metaphysical assumption, okay? And, and there is a, a major problem, and some people call this materialist scientism, that is exactly the, confl the conflation between this metaphysical assumption with uh, scientific findings as it, if it was necessary for science. However, uh, one essential point for science is intellectual humility. The point, the, 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 the basic point is the following. We actually don't know uh, much about the universe 
and uh, it's it's hard to believe that at any of one any of us can actually say for sure which which are the fundamental components of the universe or that the universe must be reduced by just such and such a particles or such and such components. Of course, we can have hypotheses on that. We can work on this, but uh, we don't need necessarily to assume this physicalist position. Actually, I personally and other uh, scholars defend some sort of expanded naturalism. Uh, naturalism does not necessarily mean physicalism. If you understand naturalism is involve everything that happens in nature. If we understand nature as everything that exists, perhaps nature is more than just matter. Thomas Nagel, one of the most important uh, philosophers of science, of mind, I'm sorry, philosopher of mind, published recently at Oxford University Press a very interesting book called Mind and Cosmos. And in this book, he also called for an expanded naturalism. For example, he said, perhaps the natural order is not exclusively physical. My guiding conviction is that mind is a basic aspect of nature that is independent support for the step to such an enlarged conception of reality. So the point is, it's possible to think of nature as not necessarily restricted to mother, matter, but also that could involve mind as one independent and irreducible component of the universe. That's the point. This is one possible perspective that has not been explained away by or uh, uh, proved wrong by science. It's interesting because usually some uh, several scientists present some evidence that they believe as conclusive evidence against some sort of dualism or some sort of mind independence of the brain. Some, uh, they believe that these are the definitive evidence that the brain produces mind, a physicalist perspective of human beings. And basically three kinds of evidence, of empirical evidence are usually present presented. One is neuro, are the neural correlates defined between, uh, of some correlations between mind activity or consciousness activity and neuronal activity. We, for example, we can use an fMRI and see the brain activation, the occipital lobe during a visual experience, for example. The second uh, sort of evidence is related to brain injury when people have some lesions in their brain, they have changes in their minds. Alzheimer's dementia is a case example. Or Phineas Gage, the case of Phineas Gage, the brain, the, that man who had a massive frontal lobe uh, the destruction, had a huge change in his personality. So it would show that if we harm the brain, we would impact mind. So People conclude brain produces mind. And the third sort of neuroscientific evidence is regarding brain stimulation or medications. For example, if it, there is a uh, stimulation uh, from, for, uh, is, is if the temporal lobe is stimulated, for example, people can have a feeling of out of body experience or something similar to out of body experience, for example or if they receive some psychedelic substance it, and they, they would have some spiritual experience, uh, it would show that uh, these experiences are nothing but uh, activation of neurons. So basically these are the three major groups of evidence that usually are presented as conclusive evidence for a physicalist perspective of mind. However, we must uh, take into consideration that these three different uh, empirical data can be also explained by non-physicalist perspectives. For example, 
Uh, first, neurocorrelates. Neurocorrelates just show that uh, some specific brain area is related to some mind experience. For example, activation of occipital lobe is related to visual experience. It does not mean that the ultimate source of this experience or the uh, is actually the occipital lobe. The same sort regard the brain injury. If we cause some damage in some brain region, it just show it just shows that uh, that region is related to such mind function, but not necessarily that it is the cause. For example, if I uh, make uh, if I damage uh, some nerves in my arm, I will not be able to move my hand. It does not mean that the ultimate source of my movement of my hand is the nerve in my arm. Even materialist perspective, the source, the ultimate source would be uh, in the cortex in, in, of the brain, not in the nerve. So, but if we damage the nerve, it will impact. And the, the third evidence regarding the brain is stimulation also just show that that area is related to such experience. Again, for example, if I stimulate some parts of my occipital lobe, I can see lights. It does not mean that all lights that I see does not exist out there. They are just nothing but the firing of some neurons in my occipital lobe. The, uh, one of the best analogies for this is regards a TV set. If you compare a TV set with a brain, uh, it, it will be very similar. When I was a child, I usually I used to think that my superheroes, the, the cartoons characters, lived inside the TV set. But later, I realized that they did not live inside the TV set but they are generated by the TV station and the TV set was just a receptor. And make the same analogy with the brain, neurocorrelates. I can find correlations between the image that I see in my TV set and the circuit inside the TV, but it does not show that the ultimate source of the TV program is the TV set. The second, brain injury. If I make some damage in the circuits of the TV, I will also have troubles in seeing my TV program. However, it does not show the TV program is created in the TV set. And this, finally, if I stimulate some circuits in my TV, if I plug, for example, a Blu-ray player, if I plug a Blu-ray player, it will show the image, but again, it does not show that the TV is the ultimate source of any of this. So all these three different uh, empirical evidence, they are very relevant to show that the brain is related to, to mind activity, but they are not good. They are not proper a proper test to, to test if the brain is the ultimate source of the mind or if the brain is just a, a tool, uh, uh, an instrument for mind manifestation. So this is essential to understand because doing just more and more of this same sort of research cannot help us in making the distinction between these two uh, aspects. Okay. And so th this is uh, very, very important. And even the, uh, 100, year ago, 100 years ago, William James, in a very important text called Two Supposed Objections to Immortality. It was a lecture from William James. And in this lecture, he discussed exactly this, and he shows that uh, both uh, theories, that the uh, physicalist perspective of mind, and also the transmission model, as James used to call a more dualist, in some sense, perspective, mind the brain, both can explain this empirical data. But that's another important aspect. Uh, spiritual experience fit much better in the non-physicalist perspectives. We'll discuss this later. And 
exactly because of that, the non-physicalist views of mind, brain, and, and of mind itself is uh, it was the prevalent view until about basically 100 years ago. Most uh, researchers, uh, philosophers hold non-physicalist views, and even nowadays, uh, neuroscientists like Mario Borrega, or even, for example, a very famous neuroscientist, neurosurgeon, neurosurgeon Wilbur Penfield. Penfield is a very interesting case because he started as a monist, and he started perform surgeries with patients awake. So he opened the school and was able to provide electrical stimulation in the brain while the patients were awake to see which are which were the regions that were generating uh, seizures and then he could remove these, these regions uh, to prevent seizures. It was in the 60s, 70s, things like that at the McGill University. And after studying the brain of hundreds of people and stimulating the brain of hundreds of patients, Uh, he became actually a dualist. He was able to see that there is no place where you could stimulate the brain that would generate a uh, decision, uh, would generate a more complex aspect of human mind. Okay, and even among scientists and philosophers and physicians, also is not uh, uh, the majority of physicalist perspectives. Uh, it's sometimes there is a majority of physicalist perspectives, but actually there is uh, also a large part that hold non-physicalist perspectives. Very recently, Thomas Na Tom, uh, uh, the philosopher of mind who talked about the hard problem, um, uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. I, 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 yeah, Dave Duchalmer. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, Dave Duchalmer uh, with another philosopher. They performed a survey uh, about what the philosophers, top, top philosophers in top philosoph uh, departments of philosophy in Europe, Australia, and North America thought about many different aspects in philosophy, uh, we, we were able to see that less than one third of them were strong physicalists. So physicalism is not that pervasive as used to, people used to think. And this is also a study that we performed among Brazilian psychiatrists. We interviewed, uh, not, not interviewed, we, we surveyed uh, 628 nine Brazilian psychiatrists at the Brazilian Congress of Psychiatry. And we asked them, do you think that your mind, your eye, is the product of brain activity? And the answer was half-half. Okay, so uh, in this study, as we found here, half of Brazilian psychiatrists accept that the mind is the product of brain activation of brain activity, but half did not accept. And similar findings we had in other studies among uh, philosophers, mental health professionals in Europe, in North America, for example. And specifically, uh, how the mind-brain problem is presented in psychiatry journals, for example, we performed a systematic review of what has been published Uh, by the three major psychiatry journals in the world uh, on the topic of mind-brain problem, okay? And it was uh, uh, interesting because actually uh, we did not have many papers on this topic, only 23 papers uh, on in 20 years in three different journals covered the mind-brain problem. However, these papers were written by, by very prestigious authors and they were very highly cited. On average, they received 130 citations on the web of science. However, these papers present a severe bias and misrepresentation on, uh, on, on the, the state of art of the mind-brain problem. Okay, these are the, 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 
the papers and the the citations, high levels of citations, as you can see, and also some very prestigious authors on this subject. And the major, the most um, important aspect of this were some severe misrepresentation of the mind-brain problem. For example, a very recurrent uh, situation was a description of the mind-brain dualism or, or Cartesian dualism, describing it is as something uh, that cannot be credible, that no learned person can accept it. So, for example, they stated, for example, that the, uh, for example, dualism is a primitive superstitious view, not intellectually credible, and no learned person accepts it. it this is a, a quote for some of these papers. And, uh, but this is not correct. M many scholars, philosophers, and scientists hold, hold in the past and hold nowadays uh, dualist perspective, for example. And they tend to assume that uh, it has been proved that mind is a product of brain activity, for example, on physicalism. And also the view that most psychiatrists accept physicalism or physicalist perspectives of mind. So all of these have not been actually supported by good evidence or uh, in-depth and careful reading of the current scholarship on this subject. So that means that quite often uh, major journals are reproducing biased perspectives on the mind-brain problems. Usually this bias is towards a uh, physicalist perspective of mind. And of course, this perspective impairs uh, the possibility of discussion of non-physicalist perspectives of mind and of course, of survival uh, of, after death. And in the summary until now, reductionist materialism is not a fact, it's, it's a it's, a respectable position, but it's not a fact, and it's not the only possibility. The empirical evidence available is not conclusive on this. The mind-brain relationship is still open. It's, a, it's still a, a philosophic and scientific open problem. Based on that, we published also uh, recently a, a paper calling for a theoretical pluralism, the need of open our minds to different perspectives. Uh, the game uh, has not finished yet. So the, uh, we are still trying to figure out in how to make sense of human experience of mind and of the mind brain problem. And among these possibilities, of course, the possibility of survival uh, of mind beyond death should be also considered and cannot be discharged uh, from the beginning, okay? And, and based on this, several researchers have proposed a more open-minded exploration. For example, Edsel Cardenia published a call for an open study of all aspects of consciousness. I was part of uh, another group of scientists published a manifesto for a post-materialist science calling for a more open-minded, rigorous, but at the same time, open-minded discussion. We cannot, we must not restrict our uh, exploration to just physicalist perspectives. Of course, physicalist perspective should be taken into consideration and should be one of the possible hypotheses to work with, but it must not be the only one. And now moving to the, to the second aspect, the importance of spiritual, religious, or mystical uh, uh, experiences. Uh, if, if we look throughout human history, spiritual experiences are probably one of the oldest human experiences that we have. Actually, the, the oldest cave paintings that we have in Lascaux, in, in France, uh, for example, or in Pont d'Arc, also in France, so two of the oldest caves 
paintings that we, we have uh, in, in the world. Uh, they show since the beginning several indications that they are talking about some kind of mystical experiences, contact with the some transcendental realm, some sort of out of body experience and things like that. Usually these mystical experiences are some sort of contact of relationship with the transcendental, immaterial, supernatural aspect of reality. And this transcendental aspect would be the deep reality, the ultimate reality, the most important of this. This is basically the base of most uh, spiritual traditions and spiritual experience. And this experience, according to several authors, we cite here different authors, these experiences are on the are on, on, on the roots, are the roots of the spiritual beliefs, the spiritual practices, and things like that. So uh, several authors defend the idea that the belief uh, in some kind of spiritual realm or even in uh, survival after death among the different spiritual traditions are based and rooted on this spiritual experience that we need to take into consideration. Some of these experiences, the most relative the most relevant of these experiences to our discussions in mind-brain problem are listed here. And specifically to survival, as you have seen in different classes in this course, we have the near-death experience, for example, mediumistic experience and cases suggestive of reincarnation. These are some of the, the, the major uh, topics in, in this area. We currently in Brazil, we are conducting our research group at the University of Juiz de Fora in partnership with the University of Virginia. We are performing a national survey of people reporting me alleged memories from previous lives. And also we are also performing a national survey of people reporting near-death experience. Not only we are interested in performing an uh, understanding of the profile of the people who report this experience, the phenology of this experience, the impact of this experience of these people, but also on the precision and if this experience are veridical in the sense of providing veridical information that cannot or uh, cannot be easily accessed by normal means. So we are uh, trying to reproduce or, or to investigate also this here in Brazil, similar to what have been done in other, in other parts of the world. And also, uh, it's important to, know, to understand that the frequency of these experiences have not been has not been vanished has not vanished as some people in academic environment or intellectual means sometimes they think for example in the united states gallup polls show that uh, people are reporting more in the last years the the feeling that they have been in touch with someone who has already died. In the 1990, 17% of Americans. In 2009, 29% of Americans. So uh, uh, different from what has been thought in, uh, sometimes in the academic environment, this experience has have not been uh, less reported actually they are still reported and some evidence suggests that they are actually increasing in their report we don't know if it's happening more frequently or people are becoming more open to share this experience however an important aspect about how we word questions in research for example if you ask people if they have been in touch with someone who has died for example 29% but if you ask the same people, is they have been in presence of a ghost, uh, only 18%. But we could think, well, okay, but a, a dead person would be a ghost. But the person says, no, no, my dead grandpa is not a ghost. It's my dead grandpa. So that's the point. It's very important 
in performing uh, studies in this topic to be very careful in how we word uh, the questions, specifically making it the more dis the descriptive is possible. Uh, when you use a, 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 a more descriptive question is much better. It avoids a lot of interpretations and misunderstandings. Okay? And, uh, and, uh, one, and what I, I'm saying also in similar to William James is that these spiritual experiences are very important to the state of mind and brain relationship. And this they study the study of the ontology of these spiritual experiences uh, has been avoided in the academic environment in the last century, for example, usually in the mainstream academic environment, because large part of the mainstream academic environment has assumed a reductionist materialist perspectives of religion, of spirituality, of human beings of the universe. And if a reductionist materialist perspective is true, religion or spiritual experience, they have no ontological reality. So usually they can be ignored or they must be explained away in the sense that they must be explained in terms of other aspects of reality uh, with no result, with nothing uh, remaining. For example, uh, we must explain away uh, the spirit experience as perceptual problems. They are just hallucinations or there are cognitive distortions, psychological needs, or they are social cultural constructions. Of course, we do not deny that these aspects play a role in understanding spiritual experience. The, our point is, are these explanations enough to explain everything? Nothing remains, or they can explain part of this experience, but they cannot explain away all the spiritual, the, the, the whole spiritual experience. This is the perspective that I and other researchers are taking. But, as William James also said, if we take a non-physicalist perspective, we, we are not uh, compelled to necessarily assume one of these two positions. We, 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 do, we, we do not need to necessarily ignore or explain them away. We can also take them in consideration in their ontological reality not necessarily assume this ontological reality in principle uh, at first but also but but uh, not ex not excluding this possibility that's the point so they must be taken also in consideration taking account in explanation there is no reason except from a dogmatic physicalist perspective that is a materialist scientism we are not compelled to follow this dogma that is the major aspect. And these spiritual experiences have been very important to their stand of mind. Even our current ideas of unconsciousness, subliminal mind, dissociation, hysteria, they, this uh, in, the enlarged the per understanding of mind, uh, w this understanding was in large part based in studies on mediumistic trance and other spiritual experiences. And based on that, for example, we we edited a book uh, uh, exactly discussing the implications of spiritual experiences to uh, the mind-brain problem. Here we have authors from different perspectives, philosophy, neuroscience, psychiatry, psychology, different areas, uh, understanding the mind-brain problem, how it has not been solved yet, and how the deep and rigorous study of spiritual experience can advance our understanding and also point toward a non-physicalist perspective of mind. So this is uh, one work, work on this. And we performed also recently 
a study, also a systematic review of the academic literature we published uh, two years ago at the Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease uh, about, uh, about papers who have uh, published uh, studies on experiences related to the possibility of consciousness beyond the brain. We performed a bibliometric analysis. We used the most important rigorous scientific database, Web of Science. It is the most rigorous database in terms of general science, in, in connect, in including basically more mainstream journals. Okay, and we investigated in these databases. We found almost 2,000 papers published on these main experiences. For example, near death experience, out of body, possession trance, mediumship, past life experience, and end of life experience. So, one major finding was first, there are not few papers, 2,000 papers in basically in mainstream journals. Okay, and also it's interesting, these papers were not published only in marginal papers. The impact factor, the average impact factor of the journals where these papers were published were similar to um, uh, other mainstream areas. So uh, also journals, uh, mainstream journals, with good impact factor, have you also published on this? And here we can see which are the experiences that have been more studied. We can see here that near-death experiences, by large, are the most studied. Okay. We have also seen that, in, but in the past, the end-of-life experiences were uh, more prevalent. And then the second point, uh, more uh, relevant are the out-of-body experiences, okay? And also we can see that mediumship has increased in the last decades. So there has been quite an interesting number of papers uh, on this topic in major academic journals worldwide, okay? And here we can see some examples in near-death experiences, for example, the, the the author who published more papers in the database web of science was Bruce Grayson. Uh, for example, in out of body experience was Carlos Alvarado. Uh, so we can see here in mediumship also Carlos Alvarado has published a lot of papers in past life experience. Ian Stevens, Erlando Haraldson, and for example, are some and end of life experience. Michael Nam, I think is the the speaker. Uh, the next speaker in, in the course. So uh, we can see here, uh, and also we can see here the impact factor uh, of this, uh, this, this paper. So we can see here a, a very interesting uh, distribution. Yeah, Alvarado, it's Carlos. Yes, yeah, it's you. <laughs> Congratulations. So you are doing a very good job in out of bad experience and mediumship. Okay. Uh, and we did also a more specific study about the near-death experience papers published in major academic journals. Uh, and we, we published a review in the last 40 years. As we saw, Bruce Grayson is the, the one who published more papers. And most of papers are actually literature review and book reviews, okay, editorial and commentary. But so we see here the more empirical data are less prevalent. This is important to take in consideration. Another, now moving to a different aspect of this uh, um, experience is, for example, the study of neuroimaging investigation of trans experience. Well, our group has performed some uh, neuroimaging, functional neuroimaging studies in mediumship. For example, here, it was a study published in partnership with Andrew Newberg. At that time, he was at the University of Pennsylvania. 
United States, and its study was conducted by Julio Perez. We, we collaborated with them, uh, and basically we investigated the mediums, Brazilian mediums, who did automatic writing. In Brazil, we call it psychography, a kind of automatic writing. They write allegedly under under the influence of a deceased personality. And we investigated, uh, we compared the brain activation of mediums during automatic writing and during regular writing, uh, re writing um, in normal state of consciousness, a uh, text by themselves, not attributed to uh, a discarnate spirit. And what we found specifically among the most experienced mediums was first the complexity of the writing of the text the complexity of the text was higher in the trans writing compared to the uh, control writing the regular state of conscious the control writing so the trans writing was more complex but despite that we had a lower brain activation in some specific areas usually relate to the elaboration of the discourse, elaboration of the speech and, and the reasoning. These areas were less activated in mediums during trans writing. This uh, evidence is in line with the medium's claim that they did not write it by themselves. They did not make an effort to produce this text. More recently, we also performed a study in partnership with Aachen University from Germany. And this study was led by Alessandro Gennato Mainieri, who uh, was at that time in Germany, and now she is working here at University Federal of Juiz de Fora. So we investigated eight mediums and eight controls. The previous study was a SPECT study. This is an fMRI study, okay? We uh, performed some neuropsychological tests and, and psychopathology tests on these mediums and also in the controls. And we investigated the resting state network and, uh, and also during trans experience uh, of these mediums. And uh, what, what happened? We asked these, the mediums to enter in trance inside the scanner, the MRI scanner, okay? And they, during this uh, trance, we evaluate their brain activation during trance and compared it later when they were again in, in the scanner and they just imagined, they relieved it in imagination and compared it to also with the resting state, okay? During this trance, mediums reported seeing and hearing spirits. They report out-of-body experience, and also they report some kind of telepathy, perceiving other thoughts and thought insertions. And what we found, basically, uh, in here in red, it trans versus rest. Okay, so we can see as expected a higher activation in the occipital lobe that is related to visual experiences compared to um, rest. But what was most in, more interesting was trans versus control. Control was the imagination. They relieved in imagination what they saw, what they hear, what, what they feel during trance. And despite they are, were trying to relieve it in imagination, during trance, they have a much higher activation, mainly in the occipital lobe, relating to this visual experience. Because they reported phenomenologically that this visual experience was as real as usual visual experience. And we, we also compared the resting state, the, the, basically the connections uh, in, in the brain, in, 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 the, in the basal, in, in the basal uh, state. This resting state was similar between mediums and non-mediums, 
but they were different from mediums from schizophrenic patients in the literature. So it seems that the, the connection, the, the connection between different aspects, different areas of the brain is uh, preserved in mediums different from schizophrenic patients. Okay, so this is one another way to understand mind-brain relationship, to understand how the brain uh, works uh, during spiritual experience. Now, finally, moving to the survival issue more directly, how can we translate a metaphysical question, if there is life after death, for example, in an empirical scientific question? The question would be, is there an empirical evidence of mind autonomy regarding the brain and of persistence of mind personality after bodily death? Or in a negative way, uh, if you can we falsify the physicalist perspective of human being, the physicalist perspective predicts that after the brain is destroyed, there must be no uh, vestige or activity of the mind, of that mind, of that personality. So if we find evidence of persistence of the mind and personality after the destruction of the brain, it would, in some sense, falsify the physicalist perspective of mind. And this is important because when we are talking in science, when we are talking to people who claim that they are uh, hard scientists, because of that, they do not believe in life after death. Okay, we can ask them, do you believe in physicalist perspective of mind? Yeah, I believe, I'm, I'm, I know, I'm sure that the brain produces mind. Okay, but if it is a scientific belief and not only dogma, a superstition, you must think in some possible empirical evidence that could falsify your physicalist hypothesis. I'm using a Popperian approach, a Karl Popper approach in falsificationism. Because if a person holds a belief, but they cannot even imagine a, a sort of evidence that would disprove his or her own belief, uh, this is not a scientific belief. It's just a, a dogma, okay? A scientific dogma, a religious dogma, whatever kind of dogma the person has. And uh, so that's the point. So we need to ask, what sort of evidence would make you reconsider this perspective? Because if the person cannot imagine any evidence, it's not a scientific discussion anymore, okay? And... What would be the what would be evidence of persistence of mind personality? The point is, how can we detect a mind or a personality? This is a very interesting discussion in, in philosophy for some centuries. This the, the question is very interesting because we how can we know that there are other minds in the universe and not only my own mind? How do I know? that Nancy and Carlos have other minds. They are not just robots, or they are just uh, uh, something different from myself. They are not human beings. They don't have uh, minds and consciousness and personality. We have, I, I, I cannot be sure of that because I don't have any direct access to their personality, to their minds. I have only phenomena suggestive of the operation of other minds. For example, Carlos, Nancy, they behave in such a way, they have a pattern of behavior, a pattern of expressing wishes, feeling, thinking. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, 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 they show some sort of continuity, a pattern that remains throughout years, uh, a pattern of a way to behave, to deal with things, a pattern of memories, of uh, feelings, of uh, ways to act, to react, that suggest that in some sense, they also have minds. 
because this is what I would expect if someone has a mind as myself. So we just have indirect evidence of that. So imagine, for example, if I myself suffer a terrible accident, a fire, so all my body is burned. And let's talk that we are in a era where when there was no DNA tests. So how my friends, how Carlos, how Nancy would know that I am Alexander? Because they would not recognize me by my body because it's completely deformed and there is no DNA. How they would know that I am Alexander? Exactly by the pattern. If this, this body that they see but they do not recognize, if this body shows a pattern of behavior, of memory, of skills that is consistent with the Alexander that they knew. That's the point. This is the similar thing. Uh, so so the, the uh, personal identity is exactly this. It's based on indirect evidence of continuity of character and memory. That's the point. This is exactly what we must search in survival research. So uh, we should show, we should search for vestige of mental activity reflecting a specific personality. For example, the memory, remembering facts, uh, different facts, identify people that the claimed personality knew, display skills like speak or write, in a foreign language, artistic skills, the handwriting, personality traits, temperament, character, personal style. So this is what uh, they would uh, seek in this in my deformed body if they meet me. And also these are some sorts of evidence that we should seek in empirical studies on uh, survival after death. It's the same. Since you cannot use anymore the body as uh, a way to recognize, we must use the uh, the continuity of personality. Okay, that's the point. And now, uh, moving to, to the end, so we would be able to open to questions, I will present uh, one study that, two studies that we performed recently uh, with Chico Xavier. Chico Xavier, he was a very famous Brazilian medium who lived basically in the 20th century, okay? In, and he re received a very low education, education, only four years of education, although he later, he read uh, quite a lot, but at six, when he was 16, 17 years old, he started to work as medium in a spiritist center. And here I say work, work in the term of precising his mediumship because he never earned any money or any material benefits from his mediumship. Okay. He always worked as a public servant. He retired as public servant and he only, uh, practiced his mediumship in other in in other periods of time that when he was not working or after retirement and he produced more than 40 50 450 books by psychography by automatic writing these books sold millions of copies he donated all copyrights to charities okay and also, he wrote 10, around 10,000 psychographed letters. These letters were written uh, by Chico Xavier in trance, allegedly uh, dictated by a, a deceased personality. And these letters were directed to uh, those who uh, stayed behind, who, who stayed here uh, and lost their loved ones. Okay. And uh, so, these letters, usually uh, he wrote these letters in, uh, in public sessions. People from all over the country came there, usually about 100, 200 people in each session. He usually had two or three sessions a week to, to, to do this writing. And in each session, he wrote about five, six letters 
uh, for these people. Sometimes, or uh, he had a, a short talk with the the, the attendees, uh, and then he wrote the letter. And one, and we investigated uh, two sets of letters of, of Chico Xavier and tried to understand the accuracy of this information and also uh, how Chico Xavier could have had access to the information. Okay, one of these papers was published at Explore uh, a few years ago. Okay, and this uh, this is a case of GP. GP was an engineering student uh, who who died drowned uh, when he was uh, 55 years old. Okay, and uh, one or two months later, his family visited the Chico Xavier, and in this first time that they visited Chico Xavier, they received the letter. And the, the sister of GP, who was there, said that they only, she only said that she had lost a brother, nothing, nothing else, okay? And in this first letter, we can see here, we investigate the fit and the leak, the, uh, the fit scale, the leak scale. The fit is how much this uh, information fits, with the reality, and also the leak information, the leak scale is the probability of leakage of this information. Okay, uh, and we, what we found here is zero is very unlikely leak, and one is unlikely leak. Okay, and for example, uh, he he wrote in the letter about the name of uh, the sister. He talked about uh, uh, a grandpa. He talked about an aunt, Elvira. And all these names, Basso and Elvira, are not usual names in Brazil, okay? And even Elvira was GP aunt. She was deceased. And even the sister did not remember uh, of this name during that period. Just later, she had to check with her mother and our relatives to know about this uh, Elvira. And all the circumstances of the death were also uh, reported uh, with precision, okay? It's very unlikely that they, uh, that she could have access to this information at that moment, okay? And, uh, and for example, some, types of information also because also he produced later some others uh, uh, letters and specifically also when a drop-in case a case where uh, 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 let me find again here uh, so the just a minute so th there was a, a drop-in case uh, some drop-in cases actually in this communication with GP because GP, uh, the, communi the communicating personality, sent a message from another communicating personality uh, that no relative was present at that uh, session and this information was later verified as accurate. I, we cannot explain explain it here in more details, but if you are interested, you can go in the paper. And now we have a, a paper that will be published in the next days, actually, at the Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease, another investigation of another uh, psychographic letter from Chico Xavier, also a very interesting uh, result, probably in the next, this week, probably on the one or two weeks, it will be published. It will be available at journals website. So uh, yeah, it's hard to see here, but it's also a, a very good uh, uh, data suggesting, in some sense, that Chico Xavier had access to information that is very unlikely that he had by normal 
means. But of course, these are retrospective studies. Retrospective studies have several problems, memory bias. We cannot control actual information leakage from that period. This is why it's important to perform also controlled studies and, and curate studies. I know that Julie Bechel was also part of this study and he discussed that. Okay. And, and finally, some final thoughts, methodological thoughts uh, and in this investigation, we published recently a paper on this, International Review of Psychiatry, about methodological guidelines to investigate these anomalous experiences and also the philosophical, epistemological, methodological regards. Uh, these two uh, papers discuss. First of all, we need to understand that the understanding of mind, of consciousness, is an immature science. We still do not have a, a good paradigm that could make sense and explain the whole uh, human phenomena, the whole mind phenomena. So we must understand that we are in an immature science. And because of that, we need to be bolder. We need to be able to, to, to take risks to, to investigate different perspectives. Also, experimental findings should be more important than theory. We cannot exclude experimental findings just because it does not, they do not fit in some theory. Because specifically, mainly in this immature science, we cannot take a, a specific theory and, and uh, use this, only this theory in, a, in discharge of other uh, uh, evidence. In the opposite, we need to use the, this empirical evidence to test the different hypotheses and using to formulate new hypotheses. Taking into consideration all findings, we cannot, uh, because of course it's very easy to formulate a theory and just pick and picture a few facts that would fit our theory and just neglect a lot of, a lot of other evidence that do not fit, okay? We cannot do this. Okay, of course, we need to avoid both dogmatic rejection and hasty acceptance of new hypotheses. It's not to, enough to say, oh, this is an old theory we need to discharge, or oh, this is new, it's good. Being new or good for a theory that says nothing about uh, uh, the importance, the quality of the theory. Some old theories can be uh, reassume they take new uh, importance later. History of science has shown this a lot for us. It's very important also to perform a comprehensive literature review uh, in different aspects, since we are doing in a multidisciplinary field. The understanding of mind, the possibility of survival of consciousness, it, takes, it, it touches in neuroscience, it touches in uh, history of religion, in theology, in psychology, in psychiatry, neurology. It takes in many, it, it touches in many different aspects. Uh, uh, to investigate clinical and non-clinical populations, and specifically also, as uh, William James suggests, we should seek for the good specimen of the class. Instead of looking for huge samples, but with people with very weak anomalous experience, it would be much better to perform an in-depth investigation of the virtues of that experience, like near-death experience, out-of-body, mediumship, or past life memories, so on and so forth. And also to have create creativity and diversity in choosing methods and also in developing new theories. This is essential. So thank you very much. This is, these are my contacts, my email, the website in English for our research group, and also our Facebook where we, we post many different uh, topics in research on this area. And finally, also our YouTube channel. It's a bilingual YouTube channel. Most of videos, most videos are Portuguese and English. And so and they are free access every week, a new video discussing different aspects of religion, of religion, spirituality, and science. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alva, uh, uh, Alexander. It was really a wonderful 
talk and um, I'm going to have a lot of fun uh, editing it because I'll have to watch it several times. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> and I think everybody, everybody uh, uh, obviously really enjoyed what was going on because they didn't leave when we, when we had our little outages. So that's fantastic. And I uh, uh, said at the beginning and, and we'll say it again, that uh, this is an excellent YouTube channel. And the, even if you aren't able to deal with the, Portuguese, the uh, the English language uh, versions of these lectures are extremely interesting, um, and of course, my favorite is Alexander Sech. But you know, that's <laughs> there's I have never not enjoyed or been informed by um, what's available on your channel. It's a really good one to um, subscribe to. So, guys, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat now, and that goes for you too, Carlos. <laughs> So we can manage this going forward. Um, uh, some of the Carlos was putting into the chat some of the links of the uh, available articles of yours that are out on the internet. Um, if there's anything else that you feel would be good for the students, feel free to send me a PDF and I'll put it yeah. up into their classroom, um, into the schedule for them for later. Any okay. questions, guys? And we also, um, uh, 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 yeah, sure, that would be fine, Marla. Um, um, we also ma we also uh, marketed this on DOPS. Lori uh, edited a version of the thing I was sending around and made sure it was out there for all of the DOPS people as well. Okay, so great. Morgan says, it was so informative, I don't know where to start. <laughs> 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 so Carlos says, uh, did someone conduct physiological or psychological studies of Chico Javier while he was al alive? Yeah, that's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, nothing was published uh, while he was alive. Uh, the only thing that I know, uh, that I'm aware of, is that uh, they performed an EEG with him during trance. Uh, I talked to the to the physician who was part of this group, but they lost the EEG of mm. Chico Xavier, and uh, they it, it was published in a spiritist uh, magazine, just a, a very short part of the EEG. So unfortunately, no, no, no nothing um, uh, was performed while he was alive. Uh, but some studies have been uh, developed later. It, it in part it can be explained also because in Brazil the academic environment uh, improved a lot in the last uh, three decades, three four decades. When Chico Xavier was Chico Xavier died in 2002, but he was very very old and frail, uh, and so uh, it, it uh, so probably if he was alive nowadays, probably it would be studies on him. But uh, but nowadays some people have are studying some of his materials. Uh, uh, for example, um, some of his po the poetry that he wrote in psychography and automatic writing, alleged uh, attributed to deceased the Brazilian Portuguese poets. Uh, these poems have been analyzed. It was the subject of a master and a PhD thesis and dissertation uh, at the University of Campinas, one of the most important universities in Brazil, provide very interesting data. So we have some studies on him, like this on the letters that we investigated, but it was a shame that he was not investigated while he was alive. Right. Um, we had two questions on this topic, and one of them was, have uh, where does the, where does the research uh, where is the research or how much research has been done on the difference between psychic experiences and schizoaffective disorders? And along those lines, how do you how do you answer the question? Well, a medium, isn't that just a schizophrenic? OK, yeah, I, I, I thought if I should include or not this topic in my talk, but I, I think it was too much already, so I removed uh, these slides. Because this actually is one of my major areas. My PhD was specifically investigating the differential diagnosis between uh, normal spiritual experience that resemble psychotic disorders from psychotic disorders with spiritual symptoms, uh, for example. Yeah, so um, in 
I, I can send uh, the, the, the links uh, to Carlos and Nancy and they can share with all of you. We, we have published with the Etzel Cardenia a, a, a paper on differential diagnosis between spiritual experience and mental disorder. But on average, uh, the point is, uh, for example, we investigate 115 mediums and we investigate their mental status. We found that they had high levels of hallucinations, visual hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, thought insertions. They had a lot of what we call in psychiatry, Schneiderian first rank symptoms for schizophrenia. They had on average four of these symptoms. However, they had a good levels of such adjustment. They have good educational level. They had lower uh, prevalence of other mental disorders, mental symptoms like uh, depression, anxiety. And one of the major aspects, so it seems that it shows that among them, uh, these experiences are normal, are not pathological. And nowadays uh, in psychiatry, itself is, has become more and more clear that what we call positive symptoms, basically hallucinations, for example, are not good markers for schizophrenia. For a diagnosis of schizophrenia, for example, is much more specific and precise. Uh, other symptoms, like we, we call negative symptoms, like affective blunting, uh, poor speech, disorganized thought, so uh, specifically more cognitive symptoms, negative symptoms are much more reliable indicators of schizophrenia than just hallucinations. So hallucinations, of course, can be a symptom of mental disorder, but there is another point. We know nowadays that about 15% of the world population report some sort of hallucination or other psychotic experience in the last year. And the prevalence of schizophrenia is about 1%. A, a huge WHO study published recently with thousands, uh, of, uh, hundreds of thousands around the globe, they found that only one-tenth of people reporting psychotic experiences actually had a psychotic disorder. So we need to be careful on this, but careful in both sides, no, in not denying the existence and the need of treatment of psychotic disorders for one side, and the other side also not considering necessarily a psychotic disorder, people having visions or hearing things. Thank you. That's a great, great response. Um, and and Carlos put up a couple of your uh, present, uh, a couple of your articles, and also a link. Um, another question oh, yeah. was, was we'll get back to uh, the mediumship thing in a second, but another question was, what percent of psychiatrists slash neuroscientists hold a physicalist view from research? Okay. Uh, the specifically psychiatrists, neuroscientists, uh, specifically from psychiatrists, the only that I know is that one that we performed in Brazil, that 50% hold a physicalist view and 50 do not. Uh, I'm aware of other studies uh, of uh, physicians and other health professionals in Europe. It's also about half-half also. And also, I said previously from, uh, uh, from David Schalmer's study among uh, philosophers in top philosophy departments about also less than half hold a strict physicalist views of human beings. But neuroscience as a whole, I, I'm not aware uh, of any study investigate specifically this, uh, this, this perspective. Ah, interesting. Um, back to the idea of mediumship, uh, uh, the question was, what's your opinion of non-pathological possession? Is it a form of religious spiritual experience? My, my, I'm sorry, could you say again your question? What is your opinion of non-pathological possession? Okay. Is it a, a form of religious or spiritual experience? My opinion in which sense? Um, I, uh, first, I would like to know how you would, how you would distinguish non-pathological possession from 
a, a putative pathological form. And um, the person, I've forgotten who it was who asked the question, is just wondering whether or not if possession is non-pathological, is that just a religious spiritual experience or is it something that indicates some other problems or something more? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm part of the uh the dissociation dissociative disorders working group from the icd 11 we are we, we worked on this uh and we stated in in, in for the icd 11 exactly G, that possession most of possession experience are non-pathological okay the possession in the sense of uh, reporting having the body controlled or under the influence uh, of the personality being replaced by another personality, another entity. Uh, uh, most of these experiences are non-pathological, okay? Uh, uh, some uh, guidelines that could help us to separate a pathological for a non-pathological experience is that the, the, uh, the pathological experience, they tend, uh, people have no control of this experience. Uh, they are not, uh, they do not fit well in, in, in some religious or spiritual tradition. Usually they are they happen in the context of other mental disorders. For example, it's quite common having, for example, a person with a severe depression and alcohol abuse and under trauma or stressful situation, they have a possession and experience. Uh, for example, this is one common way to having possession, pathological possession experience. Thank you. Sorry, it took me a bit to get uh, that uh, my mic turned back on. I was going to ask you. Uh, Morgan had had mentioned uh, DSM, uh, the DSM edition five, and uh, the insertion of trans disorder. And um, so, are you seeing a a a, a, a bigger philosophical uh, uh, um, distance? In, in those who are putting together the C ICD that's used mostly in Europe and Latin America, and those who are using um, the, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual here in the US and, uh, and in some Anglo countries as well? No, I, I don't think that is a, a, a big uh, divergence. For example, I know that Edson Cardin and others, uh, uh, Lewis, Robert Lewis Fernandes, mm -hmm. and others have worked in the, in the DSM, and I and other colleagues have worked in the ICD. And actually, I think we the basic perspective uh, we share, usually both DSM and ICD recognize that most of the possession experience are not are non-pathological. We need to be very careful not labeling them as pathological. And uh, yeah, I, I don't think that there is a, a big di divergence. Uh, is there something analogous to a trans disorder in the ICD? The, uh, yes, 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 that is. Oh, okay. Um, uh, Carlos was asking, would you say that Brazilian psychiatrists are more op open-minded about these topics as, to com as compared to Anglo-American psychiatrists? Uh, yeah, 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 I, I would say that. Uh, I think that, uh, I don't know, I think it, the idea of trans experience, for example, is much more pervasive in Brazilian culture, even in the major um, psychiatry departments in Brazil, people who received very good training abroad in Europe, in the United States. But most of these people also have some context by cultural, some, some context based in our cultural environment to this experience. They don't appear so uh, strange, so foreign. So I, I think that that is this openness and, uh, and interest in, in research in this field, yeah. Um, Patricia was saying uh, in relation to this conversation that uh, the point you made earlier about how changing the wording of a question can elicit a different type of response that she was saying regarding ghost versus the deceased person's name, as a layman, I associate ghost with an unknown per apparition, not with something like a visit in a dream, a phone yeah. call or a message through a medium. And maybe that's why there's a difference yeah. in the responses to the different wording. 
Yeah, I completely agree. I fully agree. I, I, I'm just saying that we need to be very careful because some people can just ask if they have seen a ghost and they, they, the, the researcher, for example, can include in ghost uh, also deceased relatives and sometimes the, the respondent does not think that way. I, I completely agree. Yeah, exactly. I, in my own experience, I've, um, I, I've always had, uh, well, not always had, but in several cases, I've had uh, quite strong senses of presence. And with my grandfather, who died in the late 1960s, in 1969, actually, um, while I never saw an apparition of him, so I never saw him as, a, as an apparition or a ghost yeah. or whatever, I, um, there were about six, there was about six months after his passing that, um, uh, both my, uh, uh, uh myself and another family member were reporting feeling his presence in the house and especially in his garden. And it was really strong. It was strong enough that, um, uh, I turned around two or three times expecting to see an apparition, but didn't. And that's happened to me with uh, other people, such as um, after Professor Morris died and my mother and, you know, that kind of thing, and Carlos's mom. Um, so I think we all have different experiences that we uh, uh, that we attach to uh, lost loved ones. Um, but there must be some kind of physiological or philosophical or or whatever kind of difference between us as individuals that keeps us from maybe seeing what's happening and then sometimes some of the mediums will talk about it in such a way that it's not just us it's it's a it's a systematic relationship between us and whoever's trying to communicate with us yeah i agree any more uh comments or questions guys Let's see if somebody's typing. Oh, no, I can see people typing. Couldn't see this before. Morgan says, it's wonderful. Thank you. Janine is saying, from my understanding, uh, Vudon practitioners invite possession by the spirits as part of the religion. Would be interesting to see those brain scans. She said, I'll fund the study if I ever win the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. So when we win, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> now, Carlos and I have a really long list of research we want to fund <laughs> if we ever win the lottery. Of course, we never buy lottery tickets, so, you know, <laughs> it's not working out too well. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I mean, uh, we hit two hours. I'm sure we lost about a half to the computer's prog computer problems, but I'm so glad that all, it all worked out ultimately and of course um when the recording goes up it'll have the entire session but when i uh, edit it for youtube i edit out our our unscheduled breaks as someone said morgan is saying i i could listen for another hour and not even think uh -huh. about it i think we always feel thank that you. way about your talks alexander thank you very much great pleasure <laughs> indeed uh, great marla pleasure. marla you could go ahead and copy the chat well, thank you so much, Carlson. and I are so delighted that you said yes again. I promised the students that I'm going to put up an MP4 of your previous talks for the Paramook series in their um, in the Google Doc that I'm Google folder that I'm setting up for them, um, so that they can see those as well. Because I don't think we've gotten them up on on YouTube as yet. Um, and and uh, I uh, Car I know Carlos and I wish you guys well. We think the work that you and your team are doing is very very important and just uh, just excellent. And the foundation for these these uh, broadened views of what it means to be human um, around the academic community, I think, is in large part due to the work that you guys do. So good for you. We're really uh, really um, we're really blown away by everything you guys do. It's just absolutely wonderful to see a new paper come out and hear about new research. So thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Great pleasure. Well, thank you again, Alexander. Thank you all you guys for coming and we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.